or maybe not. <laughs> oh, there we go. OK, all right, so <clears throat> I'll just give a little quick introduction about what this is all about. Um, and then um, my colleague Anshul will be able to sort of give us a little demo, uh, take us through um, the uh, open source, well, uh, this this uh, this development that he's been working on for probably around six months part time in his in his in his spare hours. So uh, we really appreciate what Anshul's done. Um, and this kind of marks the end of the first iteration of the work. So a kind of rev one, if you like, we the, the idea was to get to a kind of demoable um, point. Uh, and it's great to have a team from, you know, the free Artos team uh, joining us as well. So you can, you know, we very much invite your input there um, into what we're doing. So I'll be talking about what the problem is that needed solving. Um, and then Anshul is going to take us through the requirements analysis, design demo, um, and then we're going to just have a little bit of time to be able to um, discuss the route to opening up the repository um, to the, the wider community and there'll be an opportunity for any questions. I think we're all right taking questions as we go along, right, Anshul? Yep. Great. OK. All right. So. First up, uh, introduction, Anshul, uh, as I as I've uh, alluded to, has been uh, working on this. Uh, so Anshul, do you want to say a little word about yourself? Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, I've been associated with this project since June, as Paul mentioned, uh, working on this dynamic scheduler. Apart from that, uh, I'm employed with Oracle, have around 15 years of experience uh, in Linux kernel and hypervisor stuff. And my in my other space project, I am investigation investigating on debris mitigation. That's the new rules that FCC has framed around that. So my research spans about propulsion system and how for geo orbit and how we can abide by uh, debris mitigation and also doing some FPGA development work, implementing LDPC encoder. That's all. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Paul Madel. As I said, I'm a software engineer with around 20 something years experience writing embedded software, mostly for space applications, but um, but also for safety critical applications as well for aircraft and uh, various different domains. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of here kind of organizing the, the open source satellite software uh, collaborations that we're undergoing. Um, so many people on the call here are, are actively sort of working on some of these um, software collaborations, including Anshul. And this particular work started, as I said, about July 2020, um, and it's all part of the open source satellite, which I mentioned quite a few times. But essentially, that is kind of what it sounds like it is. It's a uh, it's a project that uh, aims to develop a next generation microsatellite platform and to be able to um, issue those desi the design of that open source, including um, electronics, uh, hardware, mechanical, software, everything. So yeah, that's that's what it, that's what we're doing. And so this particular development was all about um, the need that we had to be able to modify the code that, that we have uh, in orbit. Um, so uh, we've been doing some uh, requirements analysis and we identified sort of three distinct ways in which we might want to do that. Software patching, which is just taking a very, you know, patching a very, very small update into the code. Um, task replacement, which um, is, is, the is the subject of this development, which is where we're sort of taking a, a free RTOS task and we're replacing it um, as it's as the rest of the software is running. And then there's kind of full image replacement, which is where we're, we're uploading the entire image of the software as a big blob. Um, now, the, the problem that we have with that method um, normally is that uh, the bandwidth for um, the upload to a spacecraft is quite slow and, and the opportunities to have the spacecraft overhead are quite limited. So the amount of time that you have in order to actually, uh, you know, update software uh, in orbit is is quite limited and it can take a long time to actually upload um, you know a, a full image of the software now free Artos is quite small but um, you know in terms of footprint but you know regardless there's there's the need for us to be able to do something a little bit more swiftly so that we minimize the amount of um, uh, downtime that results from uploading and changing software okay so 
we yeah so as i said we identified we, we love we really love free artos it's great it's a really good um uh real-time operating system and i've worked with a few really really like this one because it's so so small and um so you know does what it says on the tin really um and uh uh, the only the only issue we had with it is really that uh, it doesn't support this kind of dynamic upload of code uh, to upload a task uh, real time uh, as the as the code is running. Um, but there are you know there's certainly parts of it that do support it because the the API X task create uh, can be called at any point uh, whether it's before or after the scheduler has been started. So th there is an opportunity to do it certainly, um, but there is no sort of support for dynamic linking of code. And why is that a problem? Well, um, if you take this example of three different tasks running on the spacecraft, so three different software tasks, you might have an attitude control task um, or a historical uh, telemetry task. So these are these are bits of software that are running uh, and they might rely upon something that gathers data or gathers telemetry. Um, uh, you know, all the time. One would be for, you know, telemetry that's used for attitude control, and another one might be for uh, data that you're collecting to be downloaded to the ground later on. And so replacing this task um, presents a problem because these tasks have an idea of where these functions are that are invoked in here. So um, if you replace this, then that link is destroyed. It, you know, this this where where this code ends up, it could be at a different point in the memory. So uh, that causes some issues and, and that's where we identified the need for some kind of uh, dynamic link. So at this point, that's that's really kind of outlining the, the problem, I suppose. And I'll hand over now to Anshul, who will be able to tell us a lot more about what he's done. I am trying to move into slideshow mode. Yep. So can you, uh, I need to share my screen. Share desktop. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, we got it. Okay, great. Uh, right. So these all have been covered by Paul. Uh, now requirement, just to briefly go through the requirements again. Uh, we don't want to go through the complex reboot process. Uh, there can be various uh, complications or various services that need to be restarted. So the best alternative is uh, to patch the system then and there without need, without there, without rebooting the system. In Linux systems, we have live, live patching. Uh, in Ubuntu and k splice in RHEL and Oracle Linux. Uh, safely update or reconfigure part of the system. Uh, some bugs have bug fixes, some bugs have been identified or uh, some new feature needs to be added on the running system. So yeah, we should be able to do that. It ensures long update, uh, uh, long uptime and up-to-date software. Um, so yeah, uh, these, these were the uh, main driving force and along with what Paul mentioned. So these are just basically uh, adding on to that. While designing this uh, solution, uh, what considerations I uh, took, uh, what what consideration, what were the considerations I had to keep in mind uh, while I designed this? So the footprint has to be small because and, and uh, memory footprint or code footprint uh, because it will be used for embedded devices. Um, secondly, uh, the main binary or we will call it system binary uh, has to be compiled uh, and loaded separately uh, apart from application binaries or uh, application task. That's the whole purpose. The task should be independent of the system binaries. Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry hmm. to interrupt, but I, I, I don't see the slides. Are you sharing some slides? I see one screen, but I don't see the content you're talking about. So is it just me or is it everyone? Mm, Paul, Anita, are you able to see the slides? Yes, yeah, I'm I, able to see the slides. Yeah, I can so, see them. Uh, sometimes if it if it's just yourself, sometimes you might, might have to leave the meeting and re return to the meeting. Sometimes that's a problem. Uh, okay, I'll do that then. 
Uh, I will wait for a few minutes then. Is it fine? I think the rest of us are all seeing them fine. OK. Mm -hmm. But so. yeah, teams can be a bit unpredictable at times. Mm -hmm. I had to reboot my entire computer earlier <laughs> to get it to work. Um, so shall I proceed? Yeah, I think, yeah, you, okay. you ca yeah, carry on. I'm I sure. will carry on then, yeah. So yeah, uh, one of the important design consideration is that uh, there should not be any change in free tot, free ATOS. Uh, and that's what I've been able to achieve. Uh, updatable applications should be added as a plugin component. Uh, plugin component, they should be inserted on the fly. Uh, whatever patch needs to be uh, uploaded, can be it can be uploaded from the earth station and directly to the memory of the system or, or system uh, at the spacecraft. And uh, from there, uh, the, the new patch can be, uh, the new patch can replace the old patch and system binary should be able to link with the latest patch that has been uploaded. Uh, minimal performance overhead and um, basically, um, yeah, that's very important. There should be minimum performance overhead if we want to replace old patch with a new patch. So that's again has been taken into consideration. And um, I have um, how I have implemented the solution is basically I have divided uh, the solution into various components like we use ELF binary, we use uh, system manager, uh, we, ha we have system that includes task manager and other components. I will go into details of all this. <clears throat> So just to give a uh, basic overview of, of how the code flows, um, it, it will help you to understand the solution at a broad level. Um, and then we can go into much more details and I can show you the demo. So as I mentioned, there is a system binary and an application binary. I have considered them as in ELF format. It's uh, uh, compatible with three 32 bit systems. So uh, ELF binary is inserted into the memory from a given source. Uh, uh, system binary and application binaries are compiled, converted to an ELF format and loaded into the memory. The system system or the system binary recognizes all the tasks and their entry points via inside the ELF binary. I will give you the, I will show you the code snippets, um, how we can do that, or I will show you now. So it will be good so that you get an idea what exactly I'm talking about. So uh, this application.ld, it's the linker script. Now this is the main linker script, qmu.ld. This is the main linker script, and it's linking application. Uh, it's linking to this uh, another linker script, application.ld. Now what's application.ld? It includes app appimage.ld and what's appimage.ld? It's basically the ELF image of the application, and that's how I I uh, I include application image into the main system binary. Yeah. <clears throat> so the system recognizes all the tasks and uh, all the tasks. Tasks are basically the applications and their entry point inside the ELF binary. So the system uh, parses the ELF binary. Its header I define. Uh, I define the entry point. Uh, system finds the entry point and loads the application binary into the memory. The system register all the tasks to a task manager. I will go into the details of task manager in later slides. So uh, task manager is another component. So the system uh, loads the application, uh, loads the task and registers into a task manager component. And after that's done, uh, system or the system binary calls the free RTOS uh, scheduler call to schedule the task. Uh, and then the task can uh, execute and use the kernel resources. And at that layer, the role of system binary ends, and now free RTOS is free to execute this task. The newly created task can now be inserted into free task, free RTOS scheduling list. That's what I mentioned. Now the task can use all the kernel resources and behave as a normal uh, executing task, as if it has been loaded statically. It doesn't make any difference now to it. Now it's under uh, the control of free RTOS. With dynamic linking, tasks can be externally compiled, inserted into the running system from external sources. As I mentioned now, uh, with this approach, uh, 
the 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 new the new the new patches the new task not the new task but uh, the fixes to the task can be uploaded to the main system via ftp flashcard from the earth station and it will replace the old task design and implementation uh, elf binary as i mentioned application binary elf format uh, i'm using uh, two system uh, it's two types uh, system binaries and application binaries that i will be using uh, now, when, when, when I talk about system, it consists of following components. It, it's basically a layer above free RTOS, so, and it contains the following components, memory allocator. Uh, before uh, handing off the task to free RTOS scheduler, um, one, the system is responsible, system uh, or system binary is responsible uh, to uh, allocate, uh, as I mentioned, a system binary will uh, will will parse the ELF application binary. It will allocate. Uh, it will find out what all things needs allocation stack heap uh, or any dynamic allocation. It allocates all these uh, uh, all these components of that ELF application binary. Once it has allocated all these things, then it will register the uh, all the allocated regions. Uh, inside a splay tree that I'm using, and also it will register each task or each application binary or each application ELF into a, another red black tree that it maintains. These are the components of task manager, which is one of the component of system. Then it links allocated tasks uh, or the application binaries, which is which it has loaded to the main system binary so that all the whatever symbol uh, uh, resolutions or whatever is needed, it, it does that. And then it starts the task, attaches itself to the free RTOS scheduler by calling X task create. Uh, and then once the task ends, it detaches itself. So in a, uh, overall, in a nutshell, I can say that uh, the system binary or the uh, main, main uh, module uh, is responsible for uh, bookkeeping of all the uh, bookkeeping of the task that will be running in the system. Uh, what all memory has been allocated? Where is its stack? What are the what are the pointers that the uh, task will be using? And once it has control of all these parts of uh, a task, then in the next stage, it can replace when 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 a new task or a replacement task comes, it can replace all these. Uh, all these items that are there in its register with the items in the new task. And that's the whole approach uh, of my solution. So here in the diagram, uh, we have ELF binary. Uh, ELF, uh, uh, the first one is uh, this ELF, then free RTOS, that's the main system. ELF task one, and then runtime uh, linking with ELF task one prime. So that will replace the old task one. Now the system startup process, how the system boots up. At boot time, system binary, that's free RTOS and system code. System code includes task manager, which I described. It includes memory allocator, linker, uh, uh, system sta uh, application startup. All those components are part of system code. And free RTOS is also part of system codes. At boot time, so this loads and execution starts. Then at runtime, system loads and starts all the application from the application binaries. It happens at the runtime. Application binaries are linked to the system binaries and other application binaries. Uh, and system registers all the tasks to the task managers, and then the task is uh, handed over to the free RTOS by calling system call. That's how the system starts. So these are the different stages. Uh, I won't go into details of all this, but yeah. So yeah, uh, now, uh, small uh, demo uh, before going to the demo i want to uh, i want to share that this is the work that has been done uh, my demo covers that so uh, it once i show you the demo there will be one task which is statically linked to the main process and one task which is dynamically linked and both will be executing uh, simultaneously uh, going through the code This is the main uh, 
main function main function and it calls x task create. This is the statically linked task. It's called task one and it's defined here. The task function. This is the it will print. I am a static task here. No dynamic linking. It's just calling X task create directly for this task. Now for the other task. Here it passes this simple uh, uh -huh. simple dot C is the application binary. It's, it's the separate task which will print simplest started. I am a dynamic simple. It's compiled independently in make file. I have two targets. Uh, one is for the main system and one is for the application separate targets independent of each other. This. So this simple dot C is completely independent independent of the main module. So now this is the uh, so uh, it has started the first task one. Then it comes. It loads the ELF for the simple binary which has been compiled separately. Then it calls task alloc to allocate uh, what this function does is it, it will parse the ELF binary of simple C. It will it will uh, it will see what all uh, what are the dynamic symbols, how much stack it needs, how much heap it needs, and it will allocate that. Then it will perform linking and then it will perform starting. This is the task manager function where all the main functions are defined task re task link relocations or task alloc and task registers and task linking and task start. Now this is uh, the task start. Yeah. I guess I need to again rejoin because I don't see your screen, but I would like to see the code you were sharing, so I would again hang up and join back. OK. Um, I will continue then. Yeah, maybe we can share the recording. So this is the task start. Uh, here it tries to find the simple start symbol. Uh, this is the symbol that I have defined from where uh, the application binary will uh, start its execution. I will show you that. Where is that? Yeah. Start and then simple entry. So it tries to find this symbol and then calls x task create with entry point entry point is this find the address of this symbol and from there it will start executing the simple task now to the demo Starting my QMU. And here it prints. And dynamic simple, I am static simple. So, yeah. Uh, dynamic simple is the dynamic task that gets, uh, that has been linked dynamically, and static task is the static, func uh, static task that's directly called from the main function. Both are executing simultaneously. Uh, coming back to the PPT. Uh, where is the slideshow? So this is the system startup process again. I will start the slideshow. Anyway, that's fine. So uh, what are the risks unknown? So uh, right now, I I don't have exactly the performance impact data, but as per the research paper that I'm following, based on which I have framed my solution, uh, performance impact should be minimum, but I will have better numbers when, once I have the complete demo for task replacement. So uh, how much time it takes to replace the task? I still again, I don't have the numbers for that. Uh, complexity, memory and the instruction footprint of the task. Uh, I still need to calculate that. Uh, right now the solution aims for single core and no shared memory is involved. 
um, it's a single core system where I have tried my solution and it should work on that. If it's a multi core system, then I need to take into consideration how the memory is shared and how uh, how the how, what's the state of cache. So it will involve extra complex complexity. So right now that thing has not been considered. Now so this up till this point, I have been able to um, execute static and dynamically linked tasks. Now my next aim here uh, is to simply um, modify this dynamically linked task and replace this message. I am dynamic simple with something else while this task is executing. Um, that's my next aim to achieve. That will ensure that we have replaced the task in place in memory. There will be few additional components that will be required to achieve that. Uh, one of them will be migrator. Uh, it will be responsible for migration of task. Pointer tracer. Uh, pointer tracer will be. Uh, it will build a memory layout uh, um, in a form of directed graph to keep track of what all pointers and what all uh, what all pointers are pointing to what all memory objects, uh, because you will be using pointers and memory variables, dynamically allocated memory area memory variables in your code. So pointer tracer will be the component that will keep track of uh, of where the pointers lead to objects in the memory. Dwarfif, Dwarfif is um, I will use the Dwarfif as a debug library that I will use to provide type information um, so as to get uh, the type of the pointer or the memory object that's in the memory. So these these additional components will be uh, needed. So how 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 uh, task replacement will happen once I have this solution. So same state application binary will load. It will be an inconsistent state. I will define. A check pointable state. Every task that executes uh, it has a task state associated with it. Uh, so I need to define a state where. It can be updated and I'm calling it as check pointable state and the state in which it can't be updated. That's let's call it as a dirty state. Suppose a task is um, doing some IPC calls or um, uh, interacting with some hardware. Now that's a dirty state. I, I can't replace the task at that point. So we need to wait uh, till the task reaches a checkpointable state before it can be replaced. So that's that's uh, this second point talk, uh, talks about. So wait till the task reaches a checkpointable state. Uh, suspend the original task. Allocate the updated task, link the updated task, and then copy the memory areas or whatever it is. Basically, copy the task state from uh, the new patch to 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 the old task, and link the new task and start execution of the new task. So that's how the code flow will look like in uh, once this task replacement has been implemented. So in a simple step, uh, migration process step code V1. This is the task code task code code V1 V1 and then it goes to V2 how it goes. Similarly for task data task state V1 task state V1 then CPO is CPO is a checkpointable object. So we create a checkpointable object or checkpointable. Uh, we create a checkpointable object from a checkpointable state and then from there we merge on to the next uh, V2 state. Um, again, th th this, this, is, this is the next step. I will give a more detailed demo once I have achieved uh, this task replacement. So that then I will go into much more details of how these uh, steps are executing. And, and uh, a question for you, Anshul, if I, yep. if I can. Uh, yep. I guess these uh, checkpoint um, Objects was it? Is, is that what we're yeah. calling them? Yeah. yeah. Um, are, are they continuously uh, being created, or it, is it just that you somewhere need to say, maybe via an API call, that that now is a time, as during the code's execution, where where I I you know this is a checkpointable point right here, sort of thing. Yes. I, I, yeah. So you'd sort of have like an API call saying that we are I'm checkpointable at this point. Yeah. Um, and then. Would it 
create the checkpoint um, data at that point, or would it only do that if you're intending to upload or, or to to switch to a new version of the of the task? Um, right now, um, uh, again, it's an implementation detail, so we can play around that. I don't see any harm in both the approaches, uh, except from the memory footprint. But yes, we can we can grow or we can go with the approach where it creates uh, data checkpointable object, even if it is not supposed to migrate just for the first phase. And then later on, we can change on that. But yeah, uh, it's just an implementation detail. Both the approaches yeah. are fine. Yeah. OK. Right. So yeah, uh, that's all from my side. Uh, Paul, what? Uh, and any questions before we move on to this further discussions because this is somewhat not related to um, ex uh, technical stuff. Well, I missed part of it because I was not able to look at the code, but I assume it would be available for me to take a look later, right? Yes, sure. Um, right. Paul? Yeah, I, I think I don't see a great deal of issue with that. At the moment, this is all in a, in a private repository. Uh, but certainly this video um, we can publish uh, for anybody that wants to see and um, uh, and we'll send it to yourself. I, I probably need your email address actually, um, but uh, send it to yourself and uh, and Richard as well. So you, you could have a look at um, what we've been talking about. But um, of what you did see, <laughs> did, <laughs> I don't know if you have any any words of wisdom or you know you know because obviously we're we're sort of tackling this as a, as a new problem to us and uh, and and we just really appreciate your uh, your wisdom. Hi, uh, can I just um, say uh, I've joined. I'm, this is Richard here. Extremely late. I apologise for that profusely. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but um, yeah. yeah, I really, I really sorry about that. Uh, Graf can tell. <laughs> Graf says you were recording it, so I can see the demo afterwards. So uh, again, sorry about that. Yeah, no, no problem. It's great, to, great to meet you though, and uh, yeah, very good to to have you. You know, if you know, if you could have a look at um, at what Anshul's uh, been doing, um, then you know. It would be really, really helpful to get your sort of feedback, any words of wisdom or, you know, anything that might help us along the way, because obviously you've got a lot more in-depth knowledge of free Artos than than we do. Um, so that would be very, very much appreciated. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and I guess probably just to say as well that um, we're we're um, we're a sort of space consultancy business when we're when we're not sort of producing open source designs for spacecraft. Um, we're aware of, um, you know, free ourselves being used at various for various sort of onboard systems on spacecraft, um, which I guess you might be aware of. But given the open source nature of free ourselves, you might actually not be so aware of. I don't know. Um, so I'd be interested to hear what you do know about it being used in, in spacecraft. Uh, well, um, not that much, to be honest, but I don't want to disrupt the flow of your <laughs> presentation. So if you, if you want to carry on and then we'll chat about that at the end. Or yeah, sure. The, I, yeah. I think we're I think we're at the end. <laughs> OK. <laughs> if you don't mind, um, Angela, I'd like to ask a question, a more kind of general question. It might, might lead to a, quite a technical answer. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered what were the most challenging problems you encountered to get to this point? Um, and how do they feed into your lessons learned? Yeah, uh, again, uh, in the challenging problems were while I was uh, designing and um, uh, I was thinking about all these points. So uh, one other thing was like, uh, we don't need to modify the free RTOS and uh, how we can, uh, and how I can carry out task replacement without modifying uh, uh, the, the free autos code. So I have to go through various research papers and then um, considering uh, reading the theory and converting them to practically practical code, uh, that was the challenge point and um, how, 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 how I can structure the code 
and in the end, like I, I said that there is a layer above free RTOS that uh, through and uh, where uh, the, the layer of a free RTOS is completely responsible for managing the application binaries uh, and then passing on once it has control of all the allocations of that application binary stacks, heaps, everything of that application binary and then passing on to free RTOS. So reaching to that point was the main challenging point. So designing the solution, how it can be done. That was the main challenging point. Uh, Richard, just, just to iterate so that you also get a, a feel of that. So oh, what 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 is the uh, what is the major design is that uh, I have a, I have a I have a layer uh, above free RTOS. So um, there is there is a system binary which consists of free RTOS code and task manager. I have integrated that into one layer, and there are application binaries which are compiled independently. So what uh, my system does is that. Uh, it, uh, it it loads the application binary dynamically at runtime mm -hmm. uh, in an ELF format, parses it, parses its ELF format, allocates all the memory area, uh, like all the dynamic allocation stacks, queues, registers uh, its, um, and basically after allocation in broad level, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it executes that task. Uh, it calls X task scheduler, will with the allocated area it has uh, allocated for the task and calls x task scheduler for x task create for that task so after that uh, free rtos has full control of the task and everything uh, when i want to since since my main system binary has allocated all the data for that application binary uh, system binary is awa is aware of where all the sections reside and whenever new task or whenever the replacement task comes it's able to replace those memory areas with the uh, content of the new task. That's the approach I have used. Yeah, it sounds the fact that you you can do that as a without you know without changing the kernel is yeah. you know that to me that's um, that's very interesting. Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if Gaurav has uh, spoken much about, you know, ways that we've kind of considered doing this before. So, um, I yeah, I, yet. yeah, yeah, okay. but yeah. Yeah. depending on how much is planned, I can just quickly tell about how I tried this before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of the approaches when I uh, when I was tra trying this uh, in one of our hackathons was like I partitioned the flash for every component. Uh, so what you can say is like for free R task kernel itself will reside in a partition of flash and the RAM for that partition is fixed. The same is for every other component, what I was calling, which could be comprising of multiple tasks or less or like one task doesn't matter. Then there is one loader component, which is where the system boots into. It knows all the locations of every component and then there is a specifically designed binary header which resides at the beginning of the component which tells the functions which are exported from that component and the, uh, the vector uh, interrupt handlers that component wants to install. And basically just start, uh, it just uh, uh, fills up the function pointers table and a, any component when wants to call a function in any other component will have to go through the uh, the loader which knows the location of that function and then route the function call. So that's basically any function call within the component would directly be a call and any com any call outside would the be then if uh, uh, what you call a address resolution, something like get proc address if you're familiar with the DLL terminology and then uh, call to that address. So that that's what I was uh, trying. Now then you have that, then you're free to replace the component and uh, reboot the system but one of the thing which you said is like you're not rebooting the system yeah and just uh patching it live uh, yeah. and that's why i was like it would be interesting to take a look and as you meant as i mentioned before i was not able to take a look at the complete thing so i will take a look at offline and then sure uh, i'll reach out to you if i have any questions sure yeah yeah, yeah. is this this is running on an fpga or something like that what's Microcontroller. Yeah, which which uh, target are you running on? 
So I, well, if I, I think we're we're running that currently on a QEMU yes, uh, emulation of a, of a of a target. Right. But yep. the but the uh, eventual target that we're uh, planning to fly is a, a Cortex M7 ARM core. Mm -hmm. So single core. It's not an FPGA. It's just a just a straight processor, a sort of system on a chip type thing with lots of peripherals. Right. Okay. Um, was there something? Yeah, one of one of the things which is, I, I suppose, in in your environment, it's an extremely controlled environment. Uh, so, from a security perspective, I imagine safety is more is more important. From a security perspective, as a general component, when we introduce um, dynamic linking, it it really kind of changes the threat model. Of the software, so that that's a an area of interest, kind of research interest for us, if you like, in that um, how we can kind of combine the dynamic linking with the memory protection unit mm. uh, as well. So a Cortex M7 is going to have a memory protection unit on as well. Is that is that something you've kind of thought about, or is that I you know it's kind of out of scope for your use case? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, while doing my research, uh, yes, I came across this memory protection unit. It's a, I have given it a thought, but yes, not not for this phase, but definitely in my mind for future. Yeah, yes, I'm aware well, of that. Yeah. So on on the M7, the memory protection unit is a little bit coarse, shall we say? It's you know, the way that you can partition up the memory is not it's not that useful. Should we say because because of the restrictions in the memory section sizes and the start addresses and that kind of thing? But move it on to um, uh, an ARM V8M like a Cortex M33. Then I think there's a lot more flexibility where we could potentially uh, do what what we kind of call put, you know, putting tasks within padded cells, as we say, or kind of fire firewalling the tasks from each other. And that way we can kind of protect the, make sure that the kernel remains protected. So we can kind of dynamically link application code. If you think, let me step back a little bit. The, the reason I say it changes the threat model so much is that at the moment, most of our applications are statically linked. And if we have, uh, you know, a signed image um, and we, we prevent anybody executing from RAM, then the, the threat model, as far as security is concerned, is actually very, very small. As soon as we start dynamically linking, then because we don't have that signature up front, or we don't we don't know in advance what it is that the code is going to be running, then we have to take a lot more precautions with it. And of course, we can sign you know, sign images that are being dynamically linked as well, but that then becomes a little bit more restrictive. So I don't know if I've <laughs> I don't know if I've um, I, I've kind of gone off the topic a little bit, but this is this is one of the the kind of areas of interest I think for me with dynamic linking is how we how we kind of manage the security of the system as well. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's quite a broad uh, area of interest for us ourselves as well, and and what we're finding out, you know, um, through the research that we're putting into. Um, gather the requirements together for the open source satellite is that um, really, you know, security is in its infancy, particularly in the space industry. Mm. Um, you know, there, there, there really isn't a great deal of infrastructure in place. Uh, there are some standards which are written, which aren't particularly well um, uh, utilized or, you know, there, there aren't many implementations of them. Um, so, yeah, um, we're kind of learning that as well yeah and uh i think um when 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 i talked about uh task state um this from the from this security perspective and when we talked about this checkpointable state checkpointable state is um memory allocation of a task state now for considering from security perspective it's quite possible that um, the checkpointable object or the, or the state that I, uh, that we create 
um, we can create that can be only of sub that can be only that can be the subset of the main task state um, after we have taken security into consideration. Hmm. So hmm. this yeah, uh, it's, it's just a thought. Yeah, but we um, we can cater to security. Of course, uh, yeah, we can we can dig, dig deep into it. Yeah. So, and yeah. which, which which QEMU model are you using? Uh, model means which QEMU model? Yeah, so you're you're running in QEMU at the moment. So which yeah. uh, which target in the QEMU? Oh, let, let me. Yeah. There, are, there's the ARM um, is it MP something two model or something like that. Oh, one sec. Yeah, actually, um, I, I've just got uh, that going. Was Satile PB? Yeah, so I don't think that's an M7. That one is uh, something else, isn't it, I think? I think it's an M3, actually, thinking about it. Mm. Yeah, yeah in, in parallel with this, we're trying to uh, get a QEMU implementation running specifically for the for the processor that we're, that we're choosing. Um, so uh, yeah, we're 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 working on that, and I've I've started taking apart the MPS2 um, uh, QEMU model in order to try and repurpose it for an ST an STM32 um, processor mm -hmm. that's an M7. Yeah, so the uh, Eclipse people have some STM32 models. I'm not sure whether if it's an M7 though or not. Yeah, but this the, one is that the X Pack people. Is that yeah. the same thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Had a look at those. Yeah, and I uh, don't think they have um, an M7. Uh, so I, that's why I've had to kind of fudge things together. <laughs> take take yeah. QEMU version five. I think that's when they introduced M7, and then um, taken some of the code from the X Pack, and then try to port it in <laughs> in so that I can use the M7 instruction set. Um, over QMU, so that, that's something we've been trying to I've been trying to uh, battle with over the last month. <laughs> yeah, so the the M7 is an interesting part in that the the ARM V7M spec, uh, as as provided by ARM, um, was never really implemented fully. I mean, it was always backwards compatible, but the M3 and M4. If you look at the M3 and M4 FreeRTOS ports historically. There's a lot fewer kind of memory barriers and yep. um, uh, data, you know, data barriers in there. When the M7 came out, it actually implemented the spec a lot more fully. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the M4 and the M3 one. You know, they, they were just a subset. Uh, when, it, when it comes to the M7, then what we actually did was update the M4 port. Um, to be more fully compliant with the spec, because the M7s were the first chips that actually needed it. So I'm just wondering how that would impact the QEMU model yeah. as well. So mm. it makes it more a lot That's more true. complex. Anyway, yeah, um, I agree. Mm. So yes, yeah, need so, to test it out. Yeah, on M7 also. Yeah. yeah so when, when I get my QEMU uh, going, uh, Angel would try it out on that. I suppose mm -hmm. yeah. try and port that. that. Makes That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm really disappointed that I joined so late. <laughs> I, I'm interested in um, a little bit about what, what you guys are doing as well uh, in the space world. Um, you know, what, what, what your, well, how, how your code is going to be released eventually and, and the kind of use cases for it. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, just so you're aware, we're we're doing more than just code. We're we're um we're trying to basically create an open source design for a, a complete spacecraft. So that includes um, software, electronics, um, mechanical design, the whole works really. Um, and the the intent is really at the high level to try and make a, a bit of a shift in the in the space industry. Um, so we're a group of uh, professionals who've been involved with trying to change the economics of space over a number of years. And so this is kind of our latest attempt to, um, you know, bring about a shift in the industry. And so we looked at it and said, well, it would be great if we could create something that's um, more capable than uh, what's known as a CubeSat. I don't know if you've come across those things particularly. Yes. 
Well, that's normally where I hear Freotos being used, actually, is in yeah. CubeSat. Yeah, yeah, CubeSat. It's very common in uh, with the CubeSat um, sort of community. And we're trying to create something which is slightly bigger and more capable than a CubeSat. But is it, it, we're trying to do that at a price that, that is compatible with a CubeSat. Mm. So that's what we're trying to do. So we're trying in doing that, we're trying to sort of in, encompass a lot of open source technology, uh, but also, you know, not only encompass it as in use it, but also give out open source as well. So all of our design will be put out open source. And at the moment, um, we have some, you know, repositories on, on GitHub. And uh, the hope is that this would be actually the very first thing that uh, we put out into to make a public repository. Um, so uh, I think at the moment, it, you know, it would be we, we you know essentially got a got a prototype um but i think it regardless of its state as a prototype it would be interesting to sort of um make it public um and 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 get people's view on it and also you know hopefully pick up some more collaborators along the way as well yeah yeah well definitely you know keep, keep us in the loop on what you're you're doing i mean it would be good to um you know, once it's once it's kind of published, perhaps write a little bit about it on on the uh, Freeartos website. Um, you know, these kind of interesting interesting projects that uh, find out about accidentally. <laughs> you know, it's um, the, the really the only way I find out what people are doing with Freeartos is when I go to conferences and chat with people. But at the moment, all the conferences are kind of virtual, so you don't get the uh, you don't get that chance to to chat with people and see see what they're up to we were thinking about maybe running some kind of poll over linkedin because we've got i don't know maybe 800 followers i think on on linkedin I'm running some kind of poll with to ask that question you know who's who's got any experience of using free artos for space who's actually implemented it you know what's your experience and try and you know get a, a an understanding of of where it's where it's landing and who's using it, and you know build yeah. build that community and and use that to share share information about how we're making it robust for space. Yeah, and that's that's particularly interesting. So the the robustness. So um, this is an area we are focusing quite a lot on at the moment. So Grav Grav, who's on the call. Um, he, he's our, our main guy on the ARM V8M stuff, uh, and he's you know, he's made some improvements to the V7M code as well as far as more security. So the original MPU port was, was more safety focused than security focused. So Grav's made some improvements from a security perspective. But we are also doing um, memory safety proofs and some uh, other kind of algorithmic proofs. So the queue mechanism, for example, has uh, undergone some uh, thread safety and um, memory safety proofs. So the as far as the the kind of robustness goes, then you know we're really kind of trying to beef that up a bit with some form you know formal methods. Uh, so I'd, I'd also be <laughs> again interested in in you know looking at what you guys were doing and maybe even kind of. Um, sharing ideas on on this kind of provable robustness as well so i imagine that's very important in the space world absolutely yeah we'd be interested in that wouldn't we paul yeah definitely absolutely well, that sounds really good um guys uh, i think there's probably some things that we're, you know i think the plan going forward for this development um you, you talked about um you know going to the next stage which is, which is the migration of one task to uh, uh, you know and the next one which i guess is the sort of nat natural next step yeah. um it sounds like we probably you know want to sort of look at either demoing it on some real hardware or on a qemu uh, m7 model um yes. or both you know yeah. um that sounds like a a, a good de-risking exercise yep absolutely and then, um and uh, you know, I guess there's some other little bits and pieces that we need to do to make it suitable to to make the repository um, public. So you know, just adding um, you know licensing information to the repository and the and the code and that kind of thing. Um, and then I think we're probably good to you know put it out there. 
Um, and I'm also wondering whether we should uh, maybe use some of the um, the features on GitHub to allow us to kind of publicize, you know, various bits and pieces that we might want um, developed along the way as well. Um, I don't know, I, I, Angela, I, it's, this is your baby and uh you know i don't want to i don't want to sort of suggest that other people should get involved unless you know if you've if you got the time and you've got the inclination and energy to sort of crack on through then uh you know you've done a good job so far so yeah <laughs> do you want to carry on like that or would you Absolutely. would you like some help no no for the time being yeah till first <laughs> demo till i have uh, a complete prototype ready i want to do it till that point fully okay okay yeah. OK, well, I, I think that, yeah, there's probably a few actions which I won't bore everybody with, um, you know, to sort of open up the repository. What I'll do, Richard, I'll get that um, that recording to you. Um, I've got your email address. I'm not sure uh, I don't, your colleague. Um, I don't know if I have the 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 information to get the video to him, but uh, but we'll we'll get it to you somehow. <laughs> yeah, then, I'll. Uh, I'll... Oh, if you if you send it to me, well, actually, if you could, it's just popped up in the chat, actually. All right. Yeah, I just pasted my email there, so you can okay. take it from there, or you send it to Richard, and then uh, Richard can forward me. Okay, yeah. great, great. And it, it would be good if, um, when you send it, if you could uh, provide everyone's email addresses as well, and then you've got mine and you've got Garaz, but I'll I'll reply to that email with. Um, obviously, myself, my own email will be in there because I'll be replying but I'll, with Garab's in there as well. And then everybody's got everyone's email address. Because once I've watched, uh, I'm sure once I've watched your recording, I'll have questions. Oh, yes. Please, <laughs> please feel free. Yeah. Shoot yeah. Out questions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. OK. Well, um, I think. I think that's kind of uh, that kind of marks the end of this kind of part of the development, really. And uh, I just want to say thank you very, very much, Anshul, for, you know, dedicating your time, um, you know, in your spare time, uh, you know, writing this stuff. And yep. I've been very impressed with um, what you've managed to achieve. And certainly I didn't want to take it on, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is what I thought was, it sounds like a nasty job for someone who is probably better at it than me. <laughs> so, uh, no, I really appreciate that. and. Um, yeah, great to have you as involved as well, Richard, and uh, and you know people from Free Autos really very much, um, very much enjoy having uh, you involved and found it very very good to um, to be working on Free Autos, having used lots of different operating systems and real time operating systems. This one's a good one. <laughs> so yeah, very much appreciate your uh, your efforts over the years putting it together. So uh, thank you very much and. Um, has anybody got any more other questions or anything before I close this off? Uh, can I just request also, Anshul, when you guys uh, send us the presentation, can you also link to the paper based on which your implementation is? Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. Thanks, everyone. And, and again, please accept my apologies. That was very bad of me this morning. Okay. <laughs> right. Cheers. Okay, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.